So first I would like to introduce um, Eric Mann, who his greatness continues to be his understanding of mass organizing, his commitment to building mass movements, to train mass organizers, not in the Alinsky type mode of disruptions and disconnected from reform fights, but in a Marxist-based mode of fighting to change the entire social system. He epitomizes the warrior who will never give up. He is a veteran of the Congress of Racial Equality, SDS, and the United Auto Workers. He's the, rep, the director of the Labor Community Strategy Center in Los Angeles. So welcome. Thank you. Hey everybody, thank you so much for coming. Um, this is exciting. I was in Harlem my first time uh, working with the Congress of Racial Equality, 1964, organizing the Trailways um, porters who were uh, tote that barge and lift that pail, and at that time they were uh, carrying people's bags. And they wanted to drive a bus. And uh, that was a radical concept at the time, and trailways would not let them be bus drivers or ticket agents or information clerks in that deep southern city called the Port Authority Terminal in New York. So that's where we started, was to try to fight racism in the North. I've been with the Newark Community Union and worked there for several years and lived in the black community, and then I worked with Students for Democratic Society, and I worked 10 years on an assembly line with the United Auto Workers. Uh, in between, I spent 17 months and five days in prison and 30 days of solitary and a few other things. But for the last 24 years, I've been working uh, to build the Labor Community Strategy Center, which is an explicitly left project based on different people's understandings of it, but in my case, based on what I call the, not I call, but the anti-racist, anti-imperialist United Front. And what that means is that we live in a racist society, we live in an imperialist society, which means that the United States is a world empire, and therefore the struggle against empire is the central question that determines whether or not you're left or not, let alone what the left should do. So, we fast forward today to uh, numbers, people, events. Uh, a group of organizers with the Bus Riders Union go, where the Bus Riders Union, and this is our fight. Mass transportation is a human right. We want a 50 cent fare and $20 passes, because mass transportation belongs to the masses. So, then we came up with this idea called Fight Transit Racism, and billions for buses. Fred and I both talk about the concept, he calls it prefiguration. I don't know what I call it, visionary imagination. We both operate off a very, in some way, similar concept of you dream and then you organize to achieve the dream, but that's what Lennon said. That's what Malcolm said. That's what Martin Luther King said. That's what a whole lot of people said, but it's hard to do. It's hard to lay out very bold ideas, but then realize you have to build a movement person by person to carry those ideas out. So in LA today, we developed this thing called Billions for Buses, which people laughed, laughed about. We built an organization called the Bus Riders Union Sindicato de Pasajeros, and 10 years later, we had won $2.7 billion in new buses for the black and Latino community in Los Angeles. And the Bus Riders Union is a well-known civil rights organization all over the country. We then uh, developed this concept of uh, stopping the school to prison pipeline, which is part of a broader question of stopping the mass incarceration of black and Latino people. And we like to use these counter-hegemonic concepts. So we've been developing the concept of free the US 2.5 million. Because, you know, when I was there, I was free Los Siete de la Raza, free the Panther 21, free, you know, but we have to free not just the U.S. 2.5 million, but the 7 million people that are under police control, because when I got out of prison, I still had three years of probation that they could have dropped another two years put me back in prison, 
So for those three years, I was tap dancing pretty carefully because I had a parole officer. So all the people that are meeting these young kids today were still saying, I'm on parole, I'm on probation. So we just won a very big victory in Los Angeles, which is the Los Angeles Unified School District overturned a school discipline concept called willful defiance, which had been used to expel black, mainly black boys, from the public schools under a non-arguable concept of willful defiance. And we got them to remove that as a grounds for suspension and expulsion. But the more fundamental question, and I've been thinking about this a lot, is, of course, we need a lot of willful defiance. And the pain that's been inflicted on black people through the whole series of counter-revolutions, the re-enslavement after slavery, the destruction of Reconstruction that Du Bois talks about, the uh, end of Jim Crow only to be led to the, a mass incarceration that's almost hard to comprehend because in the 60s we had 200,000 people in prison. 200,000, which we thought was as criminal as anybody could comprehend, and there's now 2.5 million. And I would argue that the hoodie, the angry black man, is the enemy of the state because the black liberation movement has played an incredibly important frame for revolutionary thought in the United States and internationally, and as the basis of my own consciousness, having worked in the black liberation movement so much in my life. So let's talk about a little theory now. We, uh, well, I'm not, everything is theory and practice. Uh, Matt, where are we in time? I'm watching my time. All right, I'm gonna keep going. In Los Angeles today, we've initiated a campaign for the fight for the soul of the cities. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about that. As I said, that's a frame based on the anti-racist, anti-imperialist United Front. Within that frame is the fight for the soul of the cities. Within that frame is the social welfare state, not the police state the environmental justice state, not the warfare state. So we are saying that as a mass question. And it's important for organizers to come up with ideas, because revolutions are fundamentally about ideas, that are starting popularizing. So a lot of people are saying, yeah, I'm for the social justice state, not the police state, which means they're beginning to articulate that we live in a police state. I'm for the environmental justice state, not the warfare state. So we're bringing that as a mass concept. And then under that, we have demands. And the demands are also very big picture demands. A thousand more buses, a thousand less police. As I say to people when you go on the bus, we want a thousand more buses, a thousand less police. What don't you understand about that? Everybody understands it. It's just a question, are they for it or against it? Then we have the free the US two million. We have a campaign, no cars in LA, which means no cars in LA. It means that if we're eco-socialists, if we're even ecological anti-imperialist revolution, then we have to radically restrict production and consumption in an imperialist nation, in an imperialist empire. That is to say, it's no longer a voluntary choice whether or not you pollute or not. It's very interesting. We want to sort of free the US 2 million point five prisoners and imprison the 8 million cars in LA and prevent them from going out. And it's very interesting how people say, you can't take away my freedom, my freedom to drive, but you can lock up all the kids. That's okay. So we're trying to have these conversations, because that's a lot what people want to do, is talk about the future of the society and the world. And we talk about the fact that the greenhouse gases in Los Angeles that we produce through our cars are killing the people in the small island states of Tuvalu, of the Marshall Islands, that is to say, their cultures are being drowned by our avarice and pollution. And they are begging us, when we went to the UN, to say, what are you gonna do about the United States? That's what the Vietnamese asked us to do. What are you gonna do about the United States? That's what the South Africans asked us to do. Don't worry about our struggle against apartheid. What are you gonna do about the United States and then be in solidarity with our struggle against apartheid? So we're raising the question that we have a special obligation, living in the heart of the empire, to be 
anti-imperialist in the most explicit and internationalist way possible. So in my opinion, the eco-socialist movement must be tied to a very explicit anti-racist, anti-imperialist politics. Because echo, as you were saying, is not automatically defined. Socialist is not automatically defined. And as a lot of people say to echo and socialist, who would not support no cars in the way, who would not uh, oppose the drones, who would talk about building socialism inside the territorial borders of the United States, and they call that socialism, which is dividing up the spoils of empire and having a redistribution theory, which is not what we believe in the strategy set. When my wife Leanne Hurstman and I went to um, Germany, and Leanne opened up and said the primary obligation of people in the oppressor nations is to support the people in the oppressed nations, the German left said, what? What are you talking about? Are you talking about Hitler? Well, yeah, but we're also talking about Germany today as the arch imperialist in Europe. And the German left just couldn't grasp Kurds or Turks or what role Germany was playing in the world. So my politics is sort of based on a couple of things right now about where the left should go. First, putting out very big picture, anti-hegemonic, counter-hegemonic ideas into society. Two, working in black and Latino communities to build the black and Latino strategic united front against imperialism which will of course reach out to Asian Pacific Islanders, to all oppressed nationality people, to anti-racist whites, to other classes and races, but it starts in the Black and Latino Strategic Alliance in alliance with the nations and peoples of the third world. That's been my strategy since I got involved in the movement before I knew what strategy was. I was against racism, I was against the war in Vietnam, and I came to understand through SNCs, hell no, we won't go through Muhammad Ali's no Viet Cong ever called me that. The concept that the Black Liberation Movement was tied to the anti-war movement and that we were in an anti-racist, anti-imperialist united front. After you put these ideas out, you got to train organizers. And we have been able to recruit young black and Latino kids uh, who have slogans, hey, Los Angeles Unified School District, I'm pre-med, I'm pre-job, I'm not pre-prison. And we have built a movement, along with other people, other forces in Los Angeles, to counter the, the racist ideology of the system. But these kids care about LGBTQ issues, they care about the war, they care about no drones, they are internationalist in their orientation, and they're, as one 27-year-old said to the 17-year-olds, when I was your age, and she had worked with us for 10 years, I said, Carla, you're only 27. Give it a break. But the point is we are training a new generation of organizers, and I'd like to talk about that later, but understand that the people who went down south were organizers. They were not simply agitators or activists. An organizer and a country, you put your body on the line and you build a movement of oppressed people. Then you have to build alliances with people that are not revolutionaries, but who actually might support you more than a lot of people who say they're revolutionaries. So don't write off the, the minister, don't write off uh, the elected official, don't write off anybody. Carry out a hegemonic campaign and then build people around your line, build forms of organization, build forms of struggle, develop an international strategy, work with people all over the world, and overthrow the empire. Now, uh, so I got a lot more to say, but I'd rather sing. So I'm going to end my song with the, uh, it's called uh, A Mother's Prayer, or Can't You See What You've Done Done by the Persuasions. And it, it embodies to me the anti-racist, anti-imperialist United Front. <coughs> boom, 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 hey, I was sitting in a park one day, boom, 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 happy as a lark one day. I heard a mother say, boom, boom, hey, on a bright and sunny day, America, boom, boom, hey, don't you see what you done, 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 done to my 
coming to a class struggle theater near you. Coming to a class struggle theater near you. I will address how all the traditions of supposed mass organizing and revolutionary strategies heretofore practiced by almost the entirety of who, who would be self-identified as the quote-unquote left must be transcended and replaced with both a different revolutionary vision and method to end industrial, patriarchal, capitalist imperialism. All revolutionaries in the Eurocentric tradition have believed that the struggle for reforms, usually considered mass organizing, are not ipso facto reformists, but, because, but can be struggled for in what has been conventionally touted as via a quote-unquote revolutionary way. Simply, reformism is the reliance upon the system, whether electing different politicians, changing laws, or allocations of funds and resources more favorable to the people. Our, pre presum our presumption of the importance and reason for why reforms must be fought for in an anti-reformist or revolutionary way has been for two purposes. One, educate the masses to the futility to the accumulation of reforms as generating any fundamental change and thereby become educated towards revolutionary consciousness. Two, to increase real benefits of democratic spaces for organizing, to alleviate oppression in some incremental ways and to make gains in furthering democratic rights. The traditional left methodology of struggling for reforms, quote, in a revolutionary way, unquote, is to rely upon the masses to amplify their independence and initiative and not be narrowed and constrained by bourgeois traps of backroom political deals, reliance upon legislative changes, and the funding benevolence of the state and corporation. Here is the problem to this presumed tried and true vision and method of quote unquote struggle for reforms in a revolutionary way. No reform struggle in the United States has actually enhanced or increased the revolutionary movement, just the opposite. Revolutionary upsurges in the past century in the United States have come about as a qualitative and significant break from the futility of relying upon the system. These revolutionary upsurges came about because of the recognition of the following problems of not demarcating from the mass reform struggles. One, if the ruling class can concede it, then it can be co-opted. Two, the benefits gained often diffuse, mislead, and dupe the masses and foster more belief in the system, not its opposite. Consequently, the little gains or the quote, better than none, unquote, attitude becomes primary as concessionary or pressure politics and as a politics of organizing around issues rather than principles. Three, from history we see that certain individuals are uncooperable, entire organizations and movements have been destroyed or derailed by the Trojan horse of mass reform struggle. Beware of the state and corporation, corporate foundations bringing concessions. They not only come with strings attached, they more dangerously contain the enemy's ethos and ensure greater captivity by the matrix. Four, the accumulation of reforms doesn't lead to self-sufficiency or the capability of revolutionaries or the masses to run society and run it in a way qualitatively better and different than the institutional practices of the system we seek to overthrow, to end and replace with a qualitatively different and better one. Something Lenin asserted, but most of us have ignored, is that revolutionary consciousness doesn't come from the working class or mass struggles, but from the outside. Revolutionary consciousness had to be prefigured on the outside first, and then according to Lenin's view, and where I take exception with him, fused within the working class and popular movements. That fusion principle, unfortunately, didn't materialize any mass independence and initiative, but brought the revolutionaries into the quagmire of compromises, concessions, and corruption. In this type of political schooling, it is no wonder that after the seizure of state power, which has been the traditional criteria for revolutionary success, that the new ruling class, ostensibly proletarian, assumes and reproduces many of the same features of the old society with hierarchy, bureaucracy, corruption, concentration of power, masculinism, masculinism, massification, and alienation. Getting more city buses and mass transit, increasing recycling, reducing carbon emissions and a new clean energy production, more taxes on the rich, all such concessions and alleged improvements 
do not, never have, and never will teach the masses how to run a society, to transcend their mental bondage to the industrial capitalist matrix, to be self-organized in perpetually creative non-institutional forms, and with a vision that remakes humanity and society devoid of money, materialistic overconsumption and accumulation, and industrialism. More of these alleged improvements only further the colonization and dependency of the masses and the supposedly revolutionary leaders into the matrix. Revolutionaries today, and most of you are comfortable, rely upon cell phones, computers, making a career, bourgeois marriage in the nuclear family, and evince tremendous amounts of alienation, which makes you incapable of truly being revolutionary because you actually cannot envision, much less make any sort of personal break from the capitalist ontology. It is only your ideas, not your behavior, that is different from your capitalist counterparts, but not qualitatively, only in simple quantifications. For example, more wages and better jobs for the proletariat, but not the elimination of the monetization of value or the elimination of wage labor and industrial production altogether. All reforms and concessions that are possible under capitalism and bourgeois rule now, more than in the past, require much higher levels and intensified mass struggle because the today's ruling class, under the rubric of austerity, is less willing to concede anything due to the minuscule or non-existent presence of independent revolutionary forces. The United States ruling class conceded to the mainstream reformist civil rights leader because the revolutionary black liberation movement was ascending and thereby transcending and eclipsing and ultimately rejecting the struggle of African American inclusion into United States society. The slavery of today is the Americanization of black people in America and their de-Africanization. Here are the things that the United States ruling class, here are the things that the United States ruling class cannot concede and for which a revolutionary struggle of intense ferocity and threat. One, the sanctity of the 50 states. E. Kuhn, an Asian revolutionary organization, in its early 1970s 12-point program in points 11 and 12 respectively, called for, quote, an end to the geographic boundaries of America, spelled with a K, and for, quote, a socialist society, unquote. Note, it didn't say a socialist USA. Two, the end of capital starting with the end of money, or more precisely, the monetization of value. What? No money? How can the world turn without money? Three, the replacement of money as the principal means of circulation and exchange by the primacy of intrinsic, not exchange, nor use value. Intrinsic value being expressed as eco-socialism. Rather than the production of use and exchange values, it is the production of flourishing ecosystems, ecosystems for their own sake. In other words, the production of values that can never be quantified, such as love, creativity, wisdom, freedom, blue whales, honeybees, and most everything in nature that is not either seen as a commodity or disposable. Four, the elimination of industrialism, the elimination of plastics and petroleum. Without the latter, industrial society would end. Without the former, there is no need for money, no need for jobs, no need for classes, and everything we understand about modern existence would cease. Five, Finally, the most difficult concept for everyone to understand because our consciousness and cellular existence has been, has been programmed to reject this. The elimination of gender, the recombining of human existence without any divisions, borders, or hierarchy. A fundamental precursor and precondition for the elimination of gender as a social differential, otherwise known as matriarchy, is the restoration of the commons, or in other words, local production for local needs. Matriarchy, I contend, was the majority of human existence before there even existed history. It was overthrown by the power of surplus and classes, which established world patriarchy, and it will be restored <coughs> with classes and the production of surplus ends. Not the, redistribution, not the redistribution of surplus that would, be, that would be fair and more equitable as Manifest Destiny Marxists assert, but the actual elimination of all surplus that has its own imperatives to engender bureaucracy, consumerism, acquisitiveness, 
and social hierarchy. Manifest these impossibles now. That is the impossibles to the capitalist system and major. That is the essence of prefiguration at the cellular level, which means each one of us personally and individually making these revolutionary visions our primary focus, and producing them in our theory and practice, even minimally in their beginning embryonic development. Prefiguration sets the preconditions for the masses, the mass struggles and movements, to, truly to be truly transcendent, in which the principles of our struggle, rather than the issues, are principle. Principles are principle. Tomorrow is now. It was Dr. Joel Covell, the great eco-socialist and SSS member, who taught me that in essence, Dr. Joel Covell just came in the room. It was the great Dr. Tr Dr. Joel Covell who taught me that in essence, the capitalist mode of production is really a mode of existence. I prefer now to use the term the matrix, a complete ontological, epistemological, and teleological colonization, meaning a matrix of our existence, our consciousness and mentality, and our method of struggle that is captured within this colonization of manifest destiny, a priori assumptions about the inevitability of whiteness and the white majority in the United States of America, industrialism, gender, and Western scientific modernism. Here's where I break with the matrix of manifest destiny Marxism, or the obsolete and toxic left that has plagued everything we've been part of for more than a century, and to which the greatest opponents, and to which the greatest opponents have not been the working class, but the indigenous peoples who refuse to be conquered and made into Americans, right, who right. refuse to have the allegedly advanced Western science and industrial technology supplant their mode of existence, which was the original communism in North America, and who have continually rejected the identities of gender and individualism that the whites imposed. One, revolutionary organizing must be decentralized, creative, self-sufficient, perpetually guerrilla and experimental, and we must reject democratic centralism as the same militarized, hierarchical, white boy, Eurocentric false democracy of decision making. The American working class has never shown a consistent and unremitting resistance to capital, not in the same tenacity as the native peoples, centuries-long wars against the USA, from its expansionist land theft and to the very theft of their spirituality and soul. Centralism is the feature of massified, hierarchical, industrial society. It is toxic. Democracy is the bullshit of bullshit. That intellectual discourse, and access and inclusion to that is the prerequisite for freedom. And not to understand what Malcolm X so incisively stated, that democracy is disguised hypocrisy. The Eurocentric ideal of democracy is the perfect form that allows the adept decep deception of bullshitters and so-called theorists, such as pedantic intellectuals, politicians, lawyers, and technocrats, to reign supreme, not the primacy of the soul, of practice and productive labor to be decisive. Everyone under democratic centrally becomes an operative, an order following automaton and capable of epiphany, imagination, and creative initiative. In a decentralized mode, a movement can much more likely have in a decentralized move, mode, a movement can much more likely have the possibility of becoming ecocentric and not egocentric. There are no gurus heavy theorists, people who are so supremely egotistical that they will be in power for decades and entire lifetimes, and thereby can only promote themselves as their main pedagogy, instead of liberating the creative leadership potential of uniqueness and the unusual. Two, life is cultural and biological diversity. The lack of cultural and biological diversity, in, what, in other words, homogeneity and uniformity, is death. Only the so-called civilized human mind and labor can produce perfect spheres, straight lines, right angles, and squares, all of which do not exist in nature. And what does this lead to? This leads to the ability to standardize and therefore mass produce. Perfection as a modernist assertion and goal is the problem. It produces all the toxic features of our movement and such as authoritarian vanguard of the penultimate and perfect political party or the quintessential political line as the sole truth. 
The bourgeois Eurocentric scientific absolutism and authority is a fixation upon EDICT, E D I C T, uh, E D I C T, also known as official truths. Rather, what should be our guiding principle is the Vulcan EDICT, I D I C, infinite diversity in infinite combinations. The egocentric imperative such, of such a mistaken conception of truth, science, and individuality and, and universality must be replaced by an ecocentric imperative that embraces discipline with creativity, precision with the poetic, materialism with the meditative, and imperatives with the improvisational. Three, codrification is the key to everything, to our successes and failures. Any and all revolutionary movement require qua cadre, but the ideal type of cadre of our past was modeled after a soldier, more of a follower and part of a group think than a creative experimentalist who can, as we quote unquote jazz musicians would say, play and interpret the score and ad lib, doing both with skill, individuality, and daring. The left has clung to the incorrect view that revolutionary cadre will spontaneously emerge from mass movements and struggles, or perhaps they would be mentored by more experienced revolutionaries. What we presently see is that neither has happened. We as revolutionaries are soul changers. We must struggle with each and every potential revolutionary that as someone who consciously is committed to, vote, to, to, to voting their life front and center to building a revolutionary movement, to change not only their ideology, but their very ontology, their soul, to becoming creative, capable, committed, and clear revolutionaries. This requires we as revolutionary teachers and leaders to boot camp new people, to get their souls and to consistently develop them just as we would be practicing a musical instrument. For the last 30 years, as the revolutionary upsurges have been crushed, co-opted, and imploded, a mass activist itis of NGOism has become dominant and hegemonic, infecting large sections of those that consider themselves still to be revolutionary. What are the symptoms? Today's mass activism incorrectly and ineffectively polarizes consensus building with the necessary importance disciplined theoretical work, and creative configurative base building strategies. <clears throat> Today's mass activists organize around issues and incremental improvements by professional paid staff who don't elevate the independence initiative of the oppressed. Today's mass organizing continues to reflect all or majority white business as usual leadership and membership instead of maroon whites who join majority oppressed nationality forms. Today's mass activism seeks acceptability to mainstream media and establishment entities instead of self-sufficient and self-reliant independent base building and so on. Is there anything from our mass movements, our so-called left tradition, that isn't obsolete or toxic? Did we do things better in the upsurges? And can we learn to revive such? I would say that there is nothing of value to take forward other than clearly knowing and breaking with that toxicity. We don't need the militaristic conceptions of discipline, the masculinist leadership, leadership models, the privileging of intellectuals and theorists, the philistinism of today's organizers who fail to study and develop creative theory, the passé and ineffective formulations of the past, such as, quote, whites should organize other quotes, whites, unquote. What that effectively does is to continue to reproduce whiteness, or the formulation of anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, anti-sexism catch-alls that list what we are against, but not daringly put forward, what are we for? What do we replace patriarchy with? What do we replace racism with? What do we replace the American empire with? Why the unwillingness to state the opposites as the replacements, such as the opposite of patriarchy is matriarchy, the opposite of racism is polycultural marooning, the opposite of the American empire or imperialism is the return of the U.S. stolen lands to the indigenous peoples and building hybrid maroon communities. And the end of capitalism isn't industrial socialism, but the restoration of the matriarchal commons, in which local production for local needs and for use is the sole imperative. Let's look, let's look at some of the major quote-unquote issues of mass struggle today and see the reformist limitations and what could be revolutionary imaginative possibilities. One, immigration. Instead of citizenship and documentation, how about the end to all borders and return of the lands to the indigenous peoples? Two, environmental. Instead of more state regulation and alternative energy production for unlimited consumption, 
How about the end to all fossil fuels, including petroleum-based production for plastics and all industrial production? Three, instead of gay marriage, how about the abolition of all marriage? Four, instead of abortion and women's rights, how about the end of the nuclear family, the abolition of gender, of, of the gender division of labor, and the commoning of child rearing? Five, instead of economic justice, how about the end to wage labor, global capital accumulation, and, and commodity production entirely? Mass organizing and mass struggle must not reproduce the massified imperatives of industrial capitalism, the very compromises and Trojan horses, horses of reformism by the requirement of prefigurative revolutionary organizing and production. I am not counterposing mass struggle and prefiguration, only stating what now should be obvious, that mass struggle reproduces all of the degradation and compromises of massified anything, and that prefiguration is the essential requirement for demassification and detoxification, that the industrial capitalist patriarchal matrix has colonized every one of us down to the cellular level. I look forward to discussion with everyone here. Thank you. Questions that are critical of the scientific soul sessions approach. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I I agree that you know reforms get us nowhere. I do think though that Eric, I agree with you that in the process of fighting for reforms is one of the ways that people get educated, and that that's where the consciousness of, of revolutionaries comes in. So an example, I've been working with um, formerly incarcerated. I've been working with formerly incarcerated people trying to get all of the, you know, the movements that are around mass incarceration to recognize that formerly incarcerated people don't just have sad stories to tell and to give the details of how awful we were treated, but have ideas and expertise and are the experts on what would replace a prison system, what would be a form of social organization, that would, what would be the form of social organization that would deal with social conflict that wouldn't be prison and wouldn't be violent. So um, in the course of that, I've actually seen uh, that revolutionary consciousness begins to emerge, especially from the women. I was at a conference a few weeks ago that was about public health and drug wars. And in the panel, people were saying, well, we need a revolution. And they had come to that through their own, through their own self education. And I guess that's part of my point is where do the revolutionary masses come from? And um, I feel that that's part of what happens when you struggle with, for reforms, because people want more places. People, people need to survive on the way to creating a different society. That's one thing. The second thing is, um, I think that had I never called myself a feminist, because I was part of the anti-imperialist movement, and we found that what was the feminist movement in the 70s to be racist. Um, but I do share a lot of the principles of how people treat each other and what the case of empowerment of women. I don't like the word empowerment because it's been used like people of color to border down. It means, you know, having a CEO who's a woman. Um, but what I mean by it is where people are respected and their ideas are taken seriously and where we look at what would be different if women were listened to. So that's number two, I think, that in the course of, of getting to matriarchy, we have to be clear that development of the power of women and disempowering male, uh, male supremacy is part of that. And number three, I'm curious, especially to you, Fred, about how you see the state as it exists now, because, and Dave and I talk about this all the time, I think Tariq is here too, another former political prisoner from the Black Liberation Movement. Um, every time we fight for the political prisoners, whether it's the amnesty, whether they're going for parole, you know, it's very hard to be, uh, to, it's, you know, conservatives and, and liberals. No, the state is a violent apparatus, and it will react that way towards any kind of revolution. So sort of what I hear you saying, Fred, is that the model is for people to remove themselves from um, 
from the way that the state is organized now, the way that the environment is organized, the way industry is organized. But how does that happen without there having to be a violent confrontation with the state? And so those are just off the top. I have a lot more for you if we ever get into it. But those are just three things right off. And thank you guys for this. And I know it's, it really takes some work um, and some work. I'm an avant-garde artist, not to have children. I mean, philosophically, I don't believe in, 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 in monogamy, marriage, or even families. So that aside, I didn't want to have children because uh, if it came down to paying my band and my artists, feeding my kids, I knew the choice I was going to make. The kids would starve. Okay. So that's a personal decision I've made. But now, we don't have an SSS, we don't have an official child care policy. And I hate the term child care. What we have done is we have made music, culture, and the arts central to everything we do. And we find that two-year-olds on up can stay the length of a program if this program was at least 50% dynamic music and arts. I just finished an off-Broadway world run called Deadly She-Wolf Assassin at Armageddon. Filled with kids. It was certainly at least R-rated in terms of violence. Right? Those of you who saw it. Okay? But the kids loved it. And it didn't breed violence in them. It raised very sophisticated music, movement, and ideas to them. In other words, it was not... The ageism comes when you actually live that division and difference and believe kids require something ghettoized for kids. I understand development is a different kind of thing, but I've met plenty of 40-year-olds 40 40 -year who still live with their parents, who still are infantile, and I've met plenty of 6-year-olds, very sophisticated and self-sufficient. The Apache had a credo for young people. Run fast. Um, gosh, I can't remember. Run fast. Rise early. Rise early. And shun no hard work. Today we have procrastinate, sleep late, and slack. Fundamental difference in our ontology, our very existence. That's all I have to say. Eric, you want to respond? Nope. So I hate the game where we say, we've got some great people in the audience, and let's hear from this one. But it is hard when one does work around political prisoners to not recognize when a former political prisoner who continues in the work is here raising her hand and wants to say something. The next question goes to former political prisoner, always an activist, Laura Whitehorn. revolutionary kids <laughs> as well as activists. So, you know, this is really um, interesting to me. I agree with a lot of what both of you say, and I have a lot of questions about it. As Fred knows, I have a lot of uh, uh, questions that are critical of the scientific soul sessions approach. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I, I agree that, you know, reforms get us nowhere. I do think, though, that Eric, I agree with you that in the process, Fighting for reforms is one of the ways that people get educated, and that that's where the consciousness of, of revolutionaries comes in. So, an example, I've been working with um, formerly incarcerated, I've been working with formerly incarcerated people, trying to get all of the, you know, the movements that are around mass incarceration to recognize that formerly incarcerated people don't just have sad stories to tell and can give the details of how awful they were treated, but have ideas and expertise and are the experts on what would replace a prison system, what would be a form of social organization, <coughs> that would, what would be the form of social organization that would deal with social conflict that wouldn't be prison, that wouldn't be violent. So um, in the course of that, I've actually seen uh, that revolutionary consciousness begins to emerge, especially from the women. I was at a conference a few weeks ago that was about public health and drug wars, and in the panel, people were saying, well, we need a revolution. And they had come to that through their own, through their own self-education. And I guess that's part of my point, is where do the revolutionary masses come from? And um, I feel that that's part of what happens when you struggle with for reforms because people want more buses. People, people need to survive on the way to 
creating a different society. That's one thing. The second thing is, um, I think that have, I never called myself a feminist because I was part of the anti-imperialist movement and we found the, what was the feminist movement in the 70s to be racist. Um, but I do share a lot of the principles of how people treat each other and what the case of empowerment of women. I don't like the word empowerment because it's been used like people of color to border down. It means, you know, having a CEO who's a woman. Um, but what I mean by it is where people are respected and their ideas are taken seriously and where we look at what would be different if women were listened to. So that's number two. I think that in the course of of getting to matriarchy, we have to be clear that development of the power of women and disempower and male, uh, male supremacy is part of that. And number three, I'm curious, especially to you, Fred, about how you see the state as it exists now. Because, and Dave and I talk about this all the time, I think Tariq is here too, another former political prisoner from the Black Liberation Movement. Um, Every time we fight for the political prisoners, whether it's through amnesty, whether they're going for parole, you know, it's very hard to, be, uh, to get released through revolutionary means if you didn't es succeed in escaping. Um, we come up against the police. The police run. The, the state is repressive. The state is violent. Teaching that is part, is, to me, is part of creating revolutionary consciousness that the state is not, you know, a, a, a a, a beneficent entity that has no, it's, you know, conservatives and, and liberals. No, the state is a violent apparatus and it will react that way towards any kind of revolution. So sort of what I hear you saying, Fred, is that the model is for people to remove themselves from, um, from the way that the state is organized now, the way that the environment is organized, the way industry is organized. But how does that happen without there having to be a violent confrontation with the state? And so those are just off the top. I have a lot more for you if we ever get into it. But those are just three things right off. And thank you guys for this. And I know it's, it really takes some work um, and some good. Well, thanks, Lauren. Thanks for the, all the work you've done. Um, I think this is definitely, uh, I mean, you know, Fred, I disagree with uh, about, you know, 39 to 71 things you said, and agree with a lot, and that's part of the struggle. And, you know, Fred and I come from, I still believe, or, well, we definitely believe, we are part of a tendency of the anti-racist, anti-imperialist movement. So that's what this conversation is about, is where is the anti-racist, anti-imperialist, uh, eco-socialist movement go? So there are two differences I'd like to focus on to at least have a conversation. One is, do we root ourselves in history of other human struggles? And I believe we do. Um, Fred, you want to make a break with all past forms of organization. Uh, that's a pretty hard uh, burden to place. That means that you're breaking with the Paris Commune, you're breaking with the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, you know, in one year after the Chinese Revolution, they got rid of foot binding and opium. Now, those are reformists, but pretty good for me. So, that's an amazing contribution. Three years after the uh, Cuban Revolution, is a film called La Maestra, in which eight, 10, and 15-year-old kids went into the countryside to teach literacy to campesinos who had never been allowed or taught to even um, write their name. Now, when Marx was talking about class consciousness, what he was trying to figure out, and Lenin did a lot more work on this, is when you read the Communist Manifesto, it does give the impression, because that was a very revolutionary time, that the revolution would be very quick. And Marx and Engels did think that, whether it was five years or ten years or whatever. They were somewhat taken back by the counter-revolution and then how long it was going to take. But those are the terms and conditions of reality. Those are not, these are the objective conditions that we can't change. If you want to will a revolution into being faster, uh, I'd like that too. But here's the reality. You go into a factory of real people, 
and you say to them, I want to talk to you about no cause in LA, or I want to talk to you about freeing the US 2 million prisoners. They don't even start with that, obviously. They just agree with you on a lot of stuff. Can you imagine the amount of auto workers and having a conversation with them about no cause in LA, or all the people that build uh, freeways, or all the people that say, what do you want from me? You know, I, I work in a car dealership. I'm Latino, and I clean the floor. Are you trying to? You know, there's a letter from uh, Marx to Engels back in 1860 or something. He said, you know, our thing is worked out in Europe, but what happens when we've exported this around the whole world and all these contradictions that take place? Well, of course, what's happening is what happens when it gets all around the world. So as it gets all around the world, the capitalist system is having more and more difficulty accumulating, which is a death sentence for it, and it is acting increasingly crazy with its, you know, tearing mountaintops off, with its, you know, everything with the fracking, tearing the earth up in an accelerated way, right? And this only increases the accumulation crisis. So you have to see the, the conjoined quality of these two crises. And the fact is, yes, 600 years, the sister pointed out, it's coming to an end. And everything that we're doing is reflected in that overriding fact. You should comment at that level. Yes, you should. Okay. Fred and then me. The resistance to capital expansion has been going on since it began. Particularly as, as it reached beyond Western Europe. We had to destroy the resistance of Western Europe, which was, it was essentially we closed the commons, turned people who worked the land into proletariat, workers who had nothing, couldn't be self-sufficient and sell their wage, and destroyed the independence of women, the witches, the witch hunts, and so forth. That was transferred to the whole world. The resistance was marched by the government of Venezuela to proceed to, to, to participate in this conference of organizations, a plethora of state governments, NGOs, non-NGOs, people's organizations, to protect seeds. Because the genome, the cell, is the next marketplace of colonization. Okay? So that's something we were going to participate in. Alright. Um, the mentality that somebody was talking about is more than just resisting it ideologically. Because I can point to you, nine out of ten leftists, particularly what leftists will say, I'm a leftist, I'm anti-capitalist, I'm anti-imperialist, I'm anti-racist, but their entire behavior and existence confirms the matrix. Confirms it. They're not outsiders, they're insiders. So they're never going to bite the hand that feeds them, only in their own mind. So where do we resist? We resist it in our souls. Okay? That is why part of the process of disalienation or de-alienation is doing whatever you can to free that soul. So when we talk about music, for instance, that music is both advanced in the sense of experimental music you heard today, if you could count it, it was in 1380 or six and a half, four. How many of you can count that? You can't because you're programmed only four, four times. Maybe one, one of my students. You can count that. Okay? That's how colonized you are, your very being, that you can't even hear beyond four, four times. So let's just make that as a metaphor for everything, what you can think about. So it's not about ideology. Because you don't have to count 13 eight. You can feel it which is what, how most musicians, the great guy from Royal Harmony in this room, playing drums doesn't count. I mean, it doesn't count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. He feels it. It's intuitive. Why? Because he says the rest of this music is bullshit. And I'm working on the stuff that means me, and I'll take any opportunity to play that music, the music that is advanced, that is soulful, that transcends 4-4. Four, four. We used to come from a tradition of leftism of thought. Leftist music was politically correct lyrics about issues, but in a form that simply appropriated boring white folk music and listless would be pop music. It didn't change your soul. It gave you the right ideas, but it didn't 
didn't change your soul. It didn't make you move differently. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, when I was doing my preparation for this talk, which has been really, I think, very helpful for it, obviously. Um, you know, I, I didn't we really had 20 minutes, so I, I wanted my song to get four, so I had 16 minutes. But in terms of things I did want to talk about, if I had to do it a little bit more time, was this about what you would go, which is to say, one, uh, in my lifetime, I've never seen materialism in such free fall at a point where the only thing that's going to protect this is the police state. So when we say the social welfare, not the police state, you don't understand that's a strategic intervention against why imperialism has 55% of the Los Angeles city budget for police is because it's a not viable system and they need to virtually create a police state. The second thing I want to talk about is that the rise of spectrum of capital, the insanity now, I don't know if people understand that George Soros got rich by betting against the uh, British pound, which meant he went to the track. He just made a bet. His bet came in, he made billions of dollars. These guys are not even trying to exploit our labor. They're not even interested in us anymore. There's much more money to be made through a bizarre movement of bonds and stocks and credit defaults and things that I still do understand. But it's all about another form of decline. Um, the third is the, um, the destruction of the wage. Um, people are not making enough money to live. Uh, the greatest increase in productivity inside the capital system is by paying you less. So that's more productivity because they pay you less and you work, even if you work the same amount, they make more money and if you can get you to work faster. So that's another thing. The declining of the class, the fact that people are literally living on each other's couches. Um, the, the, I want to talk about the structural elimination of black people from the political economy. And the, the fact that black people are now being literally pushed out of um, even cleaning houses and janitors. All the traditionally working class jobs that black people have. You know, the National Domestic Workers Association is doing some very, very good work. And then I found that there are almost no black domestic workers in what, uh, New York. So then there's the, the issue of the growing police state, the national surveillance state and the people's participation in the national surveillance state. Because there's a, a dialectic between the tremendous alienation people feel and powerlessness, and the fact that they even were happy that the government spy on them, because at least they have a personality. So when you go to Starbucks, they say, Fred, your, your latte is ready. And the person says, fuck, it made my day. They text their friend. I just got, my name just got uh, called at Starbucks. I watch people, they're really lonely and scared and frightened, and we're trying to build a movement about collectivity. Now, relating about that to Kanye's question is, no cross in LA is to meet the most revolutionary demand that I could ever hear of. We're trying to get rid of, we're actually having a mass conversation in Los Angeles that we don't want any cars on the road because there's 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and we aren't talking 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 100 years, we can debate, but you know, it's about the whole civilization versus the most, le the most conservative people are saying is debate a century or so. This is scary, scary stuff. But we have to come up with real things we're asking for. It can't be that everything we're asking for is not prefigured. That if you ask for something and for it, for it, 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 it cheapens the ideology because, oh my God, you actually wanted less cars in the way. Well, you want no cars in the way, but you got less cars in the way. So that's the point. I mean, what I'm frightened about is free the US 2.5 million was raised by us. Nobody's talking about that. And we brought that into the popular debate. Now you may not, you may, maybe that's a reform, but I damn it, I mean, if we can't win
structural reforms that got defined in imperialism, we have to up the game. Kanye said, when I say real, revolution is real, ideology is real, but ideology must exist in the material world. If, it, if it's isolated from the material world, I don't know what we're talking about, it's metaphysics. So I'm going to do the most revolutionary thing you can think of to counter climate change, but it still has to be something that you can go to a person and say, are you going to do this? This is a real thing I'm asking you to do. If you can't come up with something else to do, then I don't get it. So yes, we at this strategy is going to have a phenomenal urgency, and I think I told you that the World Summit on Sustainable Development, the people from the small island states said, but do you know what a coral reef is? Do you understand that it's destroying our ability to even have tuna? Because the tuna don't want to come in the warm work. We used to be fishing. Then we have to have a helicopter because the floods are so bad that when you're pregnant, there are all these archipelagos. You can't even have your baby anymore and get to the hospital. We do take this very seriously. And then people said, would you go back to the United States and do those radical things you can come up with? And that's what I think we're trying to do.